Hello. Welcome to the post-lunch nap time session of the day. Just kidding. It's going to be very animating and exciting. Called Political Ecology and Environmental Justice. Um, my name is Maya Bharadwaj. Uh, I have been asked to chair this session, um, which I think means very little except that I will be facilitating the flow of our conversation and hopefully successfully. Um, our presenters that we have today are Alex Lanferna, who, did I pronounce your name correctly? Uh, who's going to be presenting a piece entitled, Does South Africa Deserve Climate Reparations? A Critical Reflection on the Just Energy Transition Partnership. I'll let Alex introduce themselves during their session. And then you're going to hear from me on a methodological exploration of climate justice and movement building. And then we have two other, actually two or three other presenters who I think are not present today. Um, so we'll have a very spacious session and likely end early. Um, do you want to go first, Alex, or should I? All right, here we go. Dictatorial purchase. <laughs> All right. So hi, everybody. My name's Maya Bharadwaj, as I've said. Um, as you can hear from my accent, unfortunately, perhaps, I am originally from the US. I grew up in Detroit, which is a space that has been deeply involved in environmental and climate justice work for many, many decades, um, led by primarily black and native folks who've been placed in sacrifice zones at the helm of a big industry in Detroit. I am currently based at the University of Pretoria here in South Africa, where my research explores mm, black and brown, the possibility of black and brown solidarity building projects to upend racial capital. And the vantage point of queer Indian, South African, and South Asian diasporic leftist activism in the US, the UK, and obviously South Africa. So today I'm going to be speaking with you all on a sort of more emergent piece. So I think it will be a bit more free flowing uh, that I've been working on as I am writing a methodological exploration for my PhD, which is what I'm doing at the moment, but also thinking about praxis more broadly as it connects to academic work. So for the purpose of this presentation, I called it this mouthful entitled Transnational Environmental Justice Dreams and Praxis, Threading Diaspora Through Activism and Ethnography. So within the larger framework of this work, which is exploring the possibility of building durable solidarity between racialized groups that are often pitted against each other under the structures of white supremacy, I think I have been reflecting on my own positionality and relationship to the work so as a little bit of background, and I'll talk a bit more about this in a moment, I come to academia more recently from being actively involved in movement work. I mean, I am still as well, but as my, as my, both my primary paid work as well as my just like life work for the past 10 years. And I came to academia as a way to explore some of these questions around solidarity building that I saw were coming up across spaces that I was involved in transnationally in the US, Mexico, India, South Africa, uh, France, Argentina, blah, 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 places where I had been supporting movements, um, and thought that this would be a useful space to explore some of these questions in a more rigorous way. And I think, as is true for, for many people who make these sort of transitions into academia from whatever you were doing before, the question of like, who am I in the scope of the work comes up frequently. Um, you know, the, like the, the little statement of all research is me-search, but I think more importantly for, for me, I am curious about how academics can hold two hats at once, or ideally one hat, right? That's not just the sort of militant scholarship or scholar activist work, but using academic research and our academic positionings as ways to meaningfully strengthen movements in the day to day, rather than in five years when whatever paper we were working on gets published. So those are my core questions. I'm curious in about how particularly ethnography is, that's the sort of method that I've been using in my work, but more broadly, 
qualitative research and field work can be a part of building political ecology and, and doing the work of mo movement building in the here and now. I'm curious how this develops an element of uh, rejecting these tropes of academic objectivity and instead leaning into insider outsiderness. Um, and then recognizing that many of the threats that we are up against, be it racial capitalism, be it extractivism, be it white supremacy, are m transnational threats, right? So how do we do our resistance work, both through the academe as well as on the ground in a way that is transnational as well? Cool, so why am I doing this? Started this already. Um, but I think I've been most interested in these dichotomies that I've been seeing between what happens in academia and what happens on the ground and the notion that like social movements are a space of data collection, right? Rather than a space where we're actively involved as beings that are part of the work. I don't see any objectivity between myself and the work that I do. Here's me, had a direct action, this is some years back. Um, but, uh, and I think the, the academic work that I'm the most excited by, that I see emerging, is through the same vantage point, right? Of like active, engaged scholarship in which there's no differentiation between the person that happens to be writing and perhaps publishing and the people who are doing all the work on the day to day. And I'm also interested in how this can be a way of queering what it means to be both doing academic work as well as doing the work of solidarity building more broadly. So queering both in the, I mean, in the sort of broader political exploration, as Hook said, you know, a way of being in the world that's different. So I, I came into this project, I mean, it feels like we're like always in moments of crisis, right? Uh, they're unending. But uh, in a moment that felt particularly apocalyptic, I, I kind of embarked on this project in the, in the midst of COVID um, lockdowns, which presented strange and interesting ways of doing academic research and doing grassroots movement work. Um, we saw mass uprisings against police brutality and for broader racial justice in many of the spaces where I was tapped into movement work and research. Um, increased brutality of the state, like not just through the police, but through all elements of state forces against activists, and in some cases also against academics and writers. Uh, and I think we were really contending with notions of what isolation means under late stage capitalism, under COVID lockdowns, and under an increasingly militarized climate in which we live. Um, so this is a image from a group that I used to organize closely with called It Takes Roots. They do primarily Global North based, but sort of South in North oriented direct actions around climate justice and environmental justice, um, helming the, desire, like the, the needs and the demands of people on the front lines. Uh, so all of these questions came to me when I was involved with this project as well as in others. So in the past three years that I've, doing, that I've been doing this particular project and also more broadly over the past 15 years, I've been primarily located in movements in the US, also in the UK and in South Africa and to an extent in India. And so the project that I'm working on weaves between the three sites and what I am attempting to do both with this paper as well as more broadly with my work is to lift up the parallels and the continuities between movement building in each of these three sites. Interestingly, although I didn't come into the work focusing on climate justice or environmental justice, um, many of the folks with whom I organize, with whom I do activism, are thinking about the world in which we live and the political ecology of movement building alongside the many other parameters of their work like racial and economic justice and gender justice. So I have been joining movements, participating, doing direct action with folks, um, thinking of myself as a full participant, of course negotiating questions of trust and of relationality when you come from a different place and perhaps have a different accent. 
um, and then have been engaging in kind of deep reflective one-on-ones with folks about the work that we do together in a way that asks questions both about their individual relationships to political ecology work as well as their assessments of the sort of strategic landscape and movement climate. That is a lot of words on one slide. Um, so I don't think that what I'm saying is particularly groundbreaking in terms of method, right? There's been a lot of pushback within academia and more broadly against the sort of white supremacy light of impartiality in academia, right? Um, I think one, scholar, one set of scholars that I draw from particularly um, who are based across South Asia are Manai and Shroff, who talk about instead the possibilities for queering academia through doing bi-directional co-production of knowledge, but mo they, they call it yarian, gupshup, and baitak. So essentially these acts of gossiping or like engaging in quiet intimacies with your interlocutors, if we want to use that word, as a way of breaking down the divides between academia and movement building on the day to day. Uh, but I think that often, especially within movement building, there is a often pushback against the notion of multi-sidedness or the notion of being based across sites, of being deeply engaged across sites. I think in social movement work, we place a lot of emphasis, rightly so, on the rootedness of our local projects and of knowing the specificities of the conditions in which we are working and how they are different from other people, right? We spend decades of decades and more time building relationships, understanding the intricacies. And I think oftentimes I can be met as I'm doing my work with with pushback, right? Of like what what can there be gained from moving across spaces so frequently when you are in that way unrooted, right? It is like uprooting. But I'm interested in um, the work of a few scholars that talk about multi-sidedness, both as academic work as well as like movement building praxis as a way of articulating meaning across sites and a way of moving away from isolation, right? So I started with this concept of isolation of the individual, now moving more broadly to the isolation of these independent ecologies in which we are organizing and doing academic work. Mm -mm -mm. And then I think the last thing is, as I'm moving through these spaces, moving through these positionalities as an activist, as a, as a writer, as a scholar, um, it's important to think about the way that my life and my positionalities are, are mediating the conclusions that I'm coming to, right? Holding a Global North passport, having caste privilege, but being located within caste abolitionist work, um, profiting from anti-black systems that are true across the, the variety of spaces where I conduct my work. So I think one of the tools that I lean into in my methodology that I'm interested in centering within academic work is this idea of the one-on-one -on -one or one-to-one, -one, or it's called different things in different spaces and different languages. But it's essentially centering rather than the like unstructured academic interview, um, structuring a particular type of conversation that is structured but also very fluid and that's oriented around building trust and intimacies for the purpose of a common goal. Um, this is a flip chart from Marshall Ganz's classes that he does on, on organizing in the US, but drawing deeply from both Pilipinix and Chicane, Chicano and Chicane activism in the US and across the global south, um, farm worker organizing. So the one-on-one -on -one is a type of conversation that I do with my interlocutors that's also familiar to many folks that come out of movement building work where we enter into conversation bi-directionally sharing about our lives and the moments of politicization that shape our trajectory in movement work. So like what is my personal connection to political ecology work? I might share with them, as I'm sharing with you now, that growing up in Detroit, which is one of the most racially and economically segregated cities in the country of the US, um, made the notion of sacrifice zones omnipresent and affected my life independently in that the rates of asthma in Detroit and the metro Detroit area are some of the highest in the country and I have asthma. And that was something that was important for my 
youth and for my continued life and something that connected my lived experience to movement building, right? And I might ask people, so what brought you to this work? As a way, not of like searching for academic meaning specifically, but searching for mutual connection. And then I think the other important part is the structure of the one-on-one -on -one pushes us to consider how do we work together after the parameters of this conversation. So not, okay, I've met you, this is what's happening with my academic work, blah, 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 but like, how can we collaborate on whatever movement building projects you are engaged in? And through that, I think I've been able to open up a sort of bi-directionality and, you know, just like basic movement building that is, eh, I mean, I think it's like masquerading as academia, but for me, it's really just like doing activist work under the auspices of, of an academic project. And I'm curious, like, how do we Trojan horse movement building into academia more broadly in a space where we have, in some cases, funding or resources, where we have access to meeting spaces, where we have time on our hands, ideally, though not always. How can we orient that towards supporting movements in the, in the here and now? How can we do the work that movements are asking us to do? Um, and I think Ruthie Wilson Gilmore talks about this particularly as, as militant scholarship um, and as following the needs of, of movements rather than our own desires. So just to give you some, some like concrete examples and then I'm gonna close. Um, these are a variety of the organizations that I have worked with in some capacity through the parameters of this work. So in this like particular project that I'm doing, I'm following a specific type of activist and these are the types of folks that are involved in these spaces. So transnational organizations like it takes roots, like a group called Working on Our Power, that's pan-European, like a group called HOME, which does anti-geoengineering work transnationally, some South African orgs that some of y'all may be involved with, UK-based climate justice orgs, US-based climate justice orgs, and orgs that are broadly oriented around front lines from across different spaces. So that means like hyper-local movement building work where capacity is often a problem. Um, and in practice, what I have done and what I have been trying to do at least as an activist and a scholar is to connect these folks to themselves directly. Right, so without me being the mediator of the, their relationships, sharing like, oh, these folks in this part of the world are working on something similar. What if you two talk to each other and I can support that? Or um, here's this analysis that I read from this place that I think is super relevant to the work that you're doing here. What does it look like for us to share that? Um, yeah. Great, so these are some photos of some of the work that I have been blessed to be engaged with. This one is um, was sort of like a little united front that grew out of abolitionist groups, but many of whom are also involved in climate and environmental justice, queer justice, and like border abolition. The middle one is from folks that are like loosely uh, affiliated with XR, Joburg, and other climate justice groups. And we painted that little banner together for a, for a direct action. And then the last one is from another action that I did with the Indigenous Environmental Network and um, other folks involved with It Takes Roots against the Global Climate Action Summit in 2018. Um, and from then, collaboratively, we published a paper thinking about dynamics of just transition between Global South and Global North groups. All right, so that's it. Thank you. So now, Alex, I'd love to invite you up. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Alex Len Ferner and I wear two hats. One is as a postdoctoral research fellow at Nelson Mandela University and the other is as the elected general secretary of the Climate Justice Coalition, which is a local South African coalition of trade unions, community-based organizations and non-profit organizations working for a transformative climate justice vision. Um, and today I wanted to explore the question of whether South Africa deserves climate reparations. And this question is kind of a complex one. Um, and I wanted to use it as a means to reflect on the Just Energy Transition Partnership that South Africa is entering into to see whether it is in fact a fulfillment of climate reparations or perhaps whether it might be serving ulterior motives that aren't 
specifically the true fulfillment of climate debt that is maybe owed to certain segments of South African uh, society. So I thought I would start off with uh, this picture. This is South Africa's uh, Department of Forestries, Fisheries, Environment Minister, Barbara Creasy. Now Barbara Creasy is a pretty wealthy, well-known white South African and on the stage of the UN Climate Summit, she did um, go up and demand climate reparations for Africa, right? And now, I, I hope that uh, the, the audience shares the, the moral intuition that a white South African is probably the one least deserving or maybe most owing of reparations in the world. And so I think just this picture and that particular instance complicates the idea of South Africa being owed climate reparations. Of course, in all fairness to Barbara Creasy, she is an elected representative, and so she does represent a, a poor black majority country, so I don't think she was demanding climate reparations for herself, but nonetheless, it begins to, to complicate the question of whether South Africa itself is owed climate reparations and whether the unit of the country is the best thing to think about when thinking about who is owed climate reparations versus breaking it down into to units within the country in our analysis. And I think that's really important because, as many of us living in South Africa know, we are the world's most unequal country. We're also one of the world's most polluting. Um, and so when we think about how climate change plays out and who contributes to it, um, South Africa is quite complicated in that regard. And I think we really need to frame climate change as you know, an instance of class war, as Matthew Huber points it out, where the rich and the wealthy, individuals and corporations, are the ones that are most contributing to the problem, whereas the, the global majority, the global poor, are the ones that are most impacted by it. Now, this particular graph is from an old Oxfam report, but basically showing that the richest 10% use up about 50% of greenhouse gas consumption emissions, whereas the poorest 50% use about 10%, right? So that's kind of the, the imbalance in emissions. And South Africa, in a lot of ways, is sort of a microcosm of that global inequality. Our, our Gini coefficient, which is a measure of inequality, is almost similar to that of the global level, right? And so within South Africa, we have these inequalities in terms of who contributes, and who's impacted with the, you know, the rich and wealthy um, minority being the ones that contribute the most and benefit the most from a very extractive and polluting economic system, which makes South Africa one of the world's worst polluters. Um, we are, in terms of the emissions intensity of our power generation, the worst in the G20. Per capita, per unit of GDP, we're one of the worst polluters in the world, below just a few countries like Turkmenistan and Palau. Um, and we are nearly, we're just below the top 10 in terms of absolute polluter nations in the world. So in this particular context, I think we can think about who's owed climate reparations using maybe two complementary principles, um, and they kind of work together. One is the beneficiary pays principle, which says that those who benefited from unjust and uh, harmful systems morally owe compensation to those who are harmed by those systems. And then the polluters pay principle, which says that those responsible for pollution should pay for the harm caused, right? And I think these principles work together um, complementarity. So they're not competing principles, but they can be used together. Um, and I think one institution in South Africa which has done well to sort of embody what that might look like is the Congress of South African Trade Unions, which proposes that South Africa's just transition is funded through a range of progressive taxes, such as a wealth tax, a resource rent tax, and taxes on environmentally damaging activities. Um, some of us might remember that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, one of its recommendations was also for a wealth tax as a form of apartheid reparations. And so there is a little bit of a, a coming together of these two forms of reparations. I don't think that's an accident. Uh, the you know, apartheid and the climate crisis were both forged in very colonial extractive systems, and so it would make sense that reparations for one looks a little bit like reparations for the other because they are deeply intertwined. And at a global level, we are starting to see similar calls for wealth taxes to help poorer countries tackle the climate crisis. There was an economist letter that came out last week during the global summit for a fin new financial pact and similarly calls for taxing the wealthy and fossil fuel companies, which kind of embody that question of who should pay for reparations, right? 
So I'm going to move from the question of who should pay for reparations to like, what does that reparations look like? What are we paying for exactly? And this is where I want to start digging a bit more into the JEP-P, the Just Energy Transition Partnership. And I kind of want to suggest two minimal conditions should maybe be met for finance to fulfill climate justice. One is that it should be the case that South Africa acts in line with its fair share of global climate action. And here we do have locally the climate justice charter movements, which is calling for making ending coal, gas, and oil a condition for financial support to South Africa through the JEP. Um, and so that's one element where South Africa, as such a major polluter, can't hide behind its status as an African country and actually needs to take much more significant action. Um, and then the other more complicated one, in a lot of ways, is that climate finance should help to transform South Africa's deeply unjust society and bring benefits not to the rich elite, who themselves arguably owe climate reparations to the other global south countries, to the African um, compatriots, and so, but instead it should be going to the majority, especially the poor black and working class to benefit them. If it is to be a fulfillment of climate justice and climate debt, rather than simply using climate finance as a way of decarbonizing without really getting at those deeper questions. And so, the Just, Just Energy Transition Partnership, for those that maybe aren't familiar with it, it's a, sort of a new form of financing uh, cooperation mechanism. Um, and the aim of it is for a selection of heavily coal-dependent emerging economies, at least initially, for them to make a just energy transition. South Africa was the pilot country, and then other countries that are following suit are India, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Senegal. South Africa's jet P was with France, Germany, the United Kingdom, the United States, and the European Union, and they promised South Africa 8 billion USD through various um, financing mechanisms, including grants, concessional loans, and investments. Um, and when we start to think critically about the JEP, I think there's, there's a few sort of warning framings that we maybe, that I want to put forward when thinking about it. One is this question of, is climate finance a way of greening structural adjustment, right? So this is a nice cartoon that I borrowed from some friends who used it at IEJ, the Institute for Economic Justice. The first is this man saying, I claim this, this land in the name of his majesty, traditional colonialism. The second is the IMF saying, I structurally adjust this land in the name of economic growth. So maybe the neo-colonial picture there, where conditions are put on loans that are given to countries in the global south who aren't in a very strong position to negotiate for better financing. And those conditions can often be very unfavorable ones like privatization, austerity, weakening of local industrialization so that multinational corporations can benefit from the extraction of wealth and so on. And so part of the question we've got to be asking is climate finance a way of greening structural adjustment, making it seem a little bit more palatable because it's there to solve the climate crisis. And the reason why we should already have alarm bells ringing when we look at the JETP is because some very recent loans to South Africa have got a bit of a tinge of that green structural adjustment to them. So this was a report from the Institute for Economic Justice that just came out, and it was tracking a few loans that South Africa got just before the JETP came into place from the IMF and from the World Bank. And they came with implied or stated conditionalities. Implied was that, you know, if we give you this loan, we really want to see you doing this, this, and that. The more like explicitly stated conditionalities was we're going to give you this loan and we expect to see this as part of the loan, right? Interestingly, one of them was a COVID emergency loan, which included within it that South Africa needs to meet its climate targets. Now, I think as a climate activist, we're happy to see climate targets being something that South Africa needs to, be, to, needs to meet. But in the same breath, it was also including reducing spending on state-owned entities, moving forward with privatization of key sectors like energy, and, I mean, they didn't use the word austerity, but basically cutting back on public spending, so austerity. Um, and so we've got this sort of this backdrop of already the IMF and the World Bank giving us these particular conditionalities, and then South Africa develops its own investment plan in response to the Just Energy Transition Partnership which was announced last year, sort of midnight before the COP28, if I'm remembering my numbers correctly, um, and it was delivered by the president, kind of a, like without really anybody knowing it was about to come, this 200-page document, but it kind of boils down to this. Um, and on the face of it, it looks quite good. Um, so we've got about 1.5 trillion um, rand that is going to be spent, 
And this is basically the Jet IP is trying to build on the funding that was promised by the rich countries of the West and then have a developed local investment plan that like leverages that money, tries to tap into private finance to then deliver a localized version based on that initial Jet P, right? And so the majority of it is going to the electricity sector to decarbonize that. Uh, a large chunk is also going to what's called new energy vehicles because South Africa is not quite ready to say electric vehicles and wants to try to do hydrogen too. Um, and then the, another large chunk goes to the green hydrogen development. So I'm going to focus more on the energy sector here because that's my sort of area of focus. But there's a lot of critical questions that need to be asked around the, the, the um, new energy vehicles and the green hydrogen, particularly because as some comrades have spoken about earlier in this, that a lot of that green hydrogen is export oriented and driven a lot by the interests of you know, European countries, for example, that are trying to decarbonize and might want to use the excess land and resources of South Africa as an export to help them in that process. Questions around whether that's just or whether that really serves local interests over international interests. Now, I want to raise a few issues around the JET IP, um, thinking about these questions or these concerns about green structural adjustments. First one is around the weakening of localization. Um, so only 0.1% of the JET IP funds are dedicated to localization. Um, it's about 1.5 billion, which in itself sounds like a lot, but relative to the broader package is quite a, a small amount. And this is against the backdrop of the South African government weakening a lot of localization policies. Um, and that's really important because localization of renewable energy is where a lot of the job creation, where a lot of the economic opportunities comes, right? So if we want to think about a robust, just transition where we can absorb a lot of the labor that might be lost in places like the coal sector, localization is a vitally important element of that. Um, but we've seen localization weaken time and time again, and the JIP funds offer what is arguably a very tokenistic 0.1% towards localization. Meanwhile, we do see that Western countries are in a trade war to ensure they are the ones producing and manufacturing renewables. Western countries as well as China, there's a sort of an economic race here to dominate the clean energy industries of the future. Um, for example, here's Joe Biden, and he's announcing his big Inflation Reduction Act, and a central element of that is that renewables are meant to be made in America, which sounds great if you're an American, but it doesn't sound so great if you're a South African trying to build local green industrialization. Um, and so there is a question of when the US offers international climate finance, is it doing so as a way of creating a new market for its own industries, or is it doing so as a way of um, strengthening South Africa's green industrialization? And, I'd like to think that the many years of experience have taught us that the U.S. is not an altruistic lender of money to the rest of the world. Um, another element that's worrying about the Jet P is that most of the Jet P comes in the form of loans. Only a small percent is grants, right? So increased indebtedness means higher debt payments, and often debt, higher debt is used as a pretext to cut public spending and austerity. Um, and so I think this is, this is a big question. You know, there is a small percentage of the Jet P that is loans, but a lot of it is in the form of grants. Uh, sorry, there's, yeah, most of it is in the form of loans and a small percentage is in the form of grants. And some of the, the loans are at below market rate, but they are denominated in foreign currencies, and so there's worries about if there is currency devaluation, which South Africa has seen a lot of, then this could mean significant increase in indebtedness for South Africa. Um, and we've seen that already with uh, a loan that was given to South Africa in 2010, to the Madupi coal power plant, which many civil society activists resisted. Um, and it's kind of crazy that we're getting more debt to get away from coal just after we got a massive $3 billion uh, loan to lock us into coal when we tried to resist that. So many people are calling for um, Madupi to be cancelled at his earliest debt as a result. Um, another element that sort of ties into this question about green structural adjustment tied into the JET IP and the JET P process 
is that only 0.1% of the funds are dedicated to socially owned renewable energy. It's, again, it's about 1.5 billion out of the 1.6 trillion uh, program. And that's against the backdrop of policies that have seen widespread privatization of energy in South Africa. Um, I could, won't go into detail about that, but uh, there's, there's a long history of that. And I think when we look at this 0.1% of the funds, it reminds me of a quote by Rudolf Goldschild. I don't know if I'm saying that name right, but it says, the budget is the skeleton of the state stripped of all misleading ideologies. Now, someone like President Ramaphosa will say, no, we're not privatizing, we're not privatizing, we're just working in partnership with the private sector. But when you actually look at the amount of money that's put towards socially owned renewable energy, if you analyze the policies, there is massive privatization. Of course, it's against the backdrop of significant state owned entity failure, but that's arguably as a result of a lack of proper funding and maintenance of those state owned entities. And I think what's problematic about privatization, apart from the fact that we're putting energy, which is arguably a right, into the realm of profiteering, is who would benefit from it in a context like South Africa. So when we think about what does it take to build renewable energy, what are sort of some of the key components? Two of them are land and money, right? You need land to put the renewables somewhere and you need money to pay for them. Um, and in South Africa, land is still owned. 72% if we're looking at farms are owned by um, white people. And similarly, 72% are male owned. Um, that's according to the 2017 land audit. So, you would imagine that uh, that would concentrate the benefits of privatization of renewables in the hands of white men, if you're looking at land. And similarly, South Africa is the world's most unequal country, where 10% of the population owns 80% of the wealth. So if we privatize against the backdrop of this, um, there's a worry that that would drive deeper energy equality. And I think we're starting to see that to a certain extent um, in South Africa, where privatization is driving energy apartheid. It's a strong word, but... Wealthy individuals and corporations are able to drive forward with investing in solar, wind, and storage, and they're able to shield themselves from the worst impacts of the energy crisis here in South Africa, which has been profound. Meanwhile, the poor majority are being stuck with this somewhat decaying, underfunded national energy utility, which is ESCOM, which some of our visitors haven't experienced the worst of. This is quite a, a quiet time for us in terms of energy crisis in South Africa. It's been rough lately. Um, so I'm going to bring it to a wrap now, and, and I think part of what we need to think about when we think about climate finance is these questions of who does foreign capital serve? And so I wanted to turn to the words of Kwame Nkrumah, who says the result of neocolonialism is that foreign capital is used for the exploitation rather than for the development of the less developed parts of the world. Investment under neocolonialism increases rather than decreases the gap between the rich and poor countries of the world. I think even though we have a long history of international finance doing that, we'd be naive to think that it would be different in climate finance unless we significantly resist those dynamics, right? So what are we to do? I mean, South Africa does need climate finance, right? However, arguably not like this. And within civil society, I think there's two critical camps. Well, there's one that's happy to take it on. They're the more sort of mainstream NGOs. They're like, okay, we need this, let's do this. But then there's two more critical camps who says perhaps we must reject the JetP deal altogether, but there's another that says, well, rejecting seems like we're throwing the baby out of the bathwater because there is good stuff in the JetP. There are loans, there is funding for just transition measures for communities and workers. We don't want to chuck all that out, but we need to call for the deal to be improved. Um, and I mean, last year, the Climate Justice Coalition, which I serve as secretary of, is kind of, we've got different members in different camps there. And so as secretary, I have to navigate how the different members approach this with some wanting to reject the deal, those that are maybe a little bit more out on the left and that see this really as a Trojan horse for international capital and others that think, well, let's not reject it altogether. We need to improve it. But last year we did, we mar did a march for jobs, clean energy and climate justice around, again, I don't remember the number, COP28, I think. Um, and the, the core of our claim was that rather than the prevailing climate agenda of more pollution, privatization, and austerity, we demand real climate justice that transforms our deeply polluting, unjust, and unequal country. We must pursue a homegrown climate justice agenda that delivers millions of decent, well-paying jobs, a rapid and just transition to a more socially owned renewable energy future, and meaningful climate justice that delivers for all. And so we, our work to put pressure on the JetP and to ensure 
more robust justice is ongoing, and I think there's a lot of work to, to unpack and explore what the JETP looks like and means for South Africa. So it's very much a live discussion, so I just hope this would be a, a contribution as part of that ongoing discussion. So thanks, everybody, for listening to me. If you want to get in touch, you're welcome. If you want to find out more about the work of the Climate Justice Coalition, you're welcome too. And I've written about some of this as well, if you want to have a look. Um, and then I believe I'm branded by the National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences, so I must always thank them when I come up here because they sponsor my postdoc, so I've got to get that out the way. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>
Yeah, um, thank you very much also for your presentations. It was very interesting. I have um, a bit of a maybe a clarification also question um, because uh, in your presentation, uh, Maya, um, I saw like queering notion of solidarity and I was wondering if you could um, elaborate a little bit on this, on what this means in, in a broader sense of making, yeah, of deep solidarity and um, Great, so I think we'll respond to these three first, and then I think there, are, I at least saw three other hands before, so we'll come back to you all, if that's cool. Um, do you wanna go first? Do you want me to go first? Either way, I can go if you want. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe just to go to Matthew's question around co-optation, um, it's so important. Um, is that Gandhi quote, is that first they laugh at you, then they, well first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then they win. But the step that's missing in there is that they will then co-opt your language and pretend that a win for them is a win for you. Um, and, and that seems to be happening all over the place. Not only with like the, I mean the just transition, you have people as noxious as Gwede Montashe who will say, that working with Shell to override the interests of local communities for oil and gas is part of a just transition and what Africa is owed for its climate debt, which is a complete perversion of the idea of climate debt for Africa um, because it is in service of multinational European corporations predominantly. But there's this like crude identity politics and this noxious uh, propaganda that tries to legitimate that and we see it in even like the East African crude oil pipeline or the Mozambique gas extraction where we have these multinational corporations that are using African climate debts as their legitimating um, ideology. Um, and so it's, it's very, very prevalent and, and the, the propaganda machines of these corporations are well oiled. Um, excuse the pun, um, because they, they really are so adept at taking the language of activists and, and trying to blunt them and move them into directions that serve their interests. Um, so we, we need to fight that. And a part of it, I mean, part of what we've done historically is use satire as a tool to just fight against the ridiculous appropriation of our language and just show how absurd it is. So when we did our mobilizations against the Department of Mineral Resource and Energy, we worked with a, youth, uh, a youthful um, satire group called Politically Aware, where we kind of did this advert pretending that the Department of Mineral Resource and Energy was selling our country off to fossil fuel corporations. Got a lot of pushback, they were threatening to sue us. Um, and it won a South African Film and Television Award, um, which was great. Um, but I think sometimes that's the, that's the way to like expose the lie is, is that. Um, and then just I'll quickly answer the one about bringing together divergent understandings um, across like coalition. It's really tough, um, I think, to, because there are so many, especially with a complex thing like the Jet P, it's this massive, massive deal. So it's not so easy to just say like reject it altogether because there's so many elements of it. The fact that the president dropped the 200 page document the night before COP was supposed to happen and then said, well, we're gonna consult on this later is really problematic because there's so much in there and each thing needs to be, I think, negotiated on its own terms. So I think this is where like to just take a blanket statement on the Jet P is really difficult and particularly to do it as a full coalition rather than working through like what pieces are good, what pieces are bad. And I think that's the problem with these mega deals is that they're just thrown together as this massive package and you don't get to engage in the ways that would make for meaningful consultation. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll leave it there and hand over to you. Thank you, Alex. I love that example of the, the satirical, satirical work uh, disrupting cultural hegemony, hey, yo. Um, so I'll start with the, the first question and kind of comment about when our work is explicitly politicized versus what is normalized. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, I agree with you. <laughs> um, I think we often erase the political from our work in academia because it's not with a group that explicitly talks about its work as political, but like all, all life that we're doing, right? All work within academia has some element of the political within it. So I think the way that I've approached that and what I heard you start to talk about was just to be explicit about the political orientations and frameworks of my work 
And I think I've been really lucky, especially with my work here, as well as in the UK, maybe a little bit more difficult in the US, to work with, with like, like comrades, comrades who, who are within academia, but similarly are, are thinking about their work and doing their work as, um, as being actively engaged within movements. So I think I have been particularly fortunate not to receive as much pushback because of just the incredible community of scholar activists in this country and, and also in other parts of the world. And so I, I think like building that camaraderie has been a really key part of my work as well, so that I'm similarly learning from folks that are navigating the situations in, in similar ways. And I'm sure that's true for you too, Alex. Um, the question also about kind of working with people who have divergent views. Um, yeah, I mean, like from a research standpoint, it's super interesting, hey? Because there's people who do their activism in a way that I, that I personally like absolutely do not agree with. But I think it's useful to document that in the work. And oftentimes I'm meeting with people who are, <laughs> are like, you know, dismantling what they see as wrong with these other activist projects themselves. So I don't even have to insert myself into that conversation. I just get to like juxtapose the conversation that's already happening between activists. Um, so I think one example is uh, Joburg Pride is, I mean, I'm personally, I feel extremely corporatized and depoliticized and it is also um, at the moment run by a queer Indian South African person. Uh, and so I think I had the fortune of getting to document the conversations that was happening between this person and between like very leftist Indian South Africans who are decrying the like pink washing of, of a corporate led pride um, and get to kind of lift up those conversations in the public sphere. And, and just for myself personally, I mean, I think I feel comfortable deciding that, okay, like you're, you're cool and I'm gonna write about the work that you're doing, but I'm maybe not gonna <laughs> lean into comradeship with you ongoing. And perhaps that's not objective, but I think as I was talking about, like I'm, I'm okay with that. And I've been lucky to have supporters of my work who are okay with that. And then the last one about queering notions of solidarity. Yeah, I won't, I won't say too much about this here because I could literally talk at you for many hours about this. this is the core concept in my PhD work. Um, but I think the core things that I'm considering when it comes to queering notions of solidarity are one, the way that relationship building and intimacy are a core part of activism, and that especially when we are bridging across different views, right, or different positionalities, these practices of building relationship are something that are often discarded when we're in like really crisis moments of activism, but throughout my work I've seen as the most foundational parts of the work. Um, and often things that are helmed by queer folks or by you know, gender diverse folks. Not always, but, but often. And then I think I, I hear, so this is a drawing from one of my interlocutors, the framing of organizing as war or activism as war versus the framing of social movement work as building something new, right? As birthing, as creating. And it doesn't have to be that dichotomous. It can be both of those things at once. But I think another element of queering solidarity is the focus on like, what are we trying to build? And how do we do that praxis of building alongside the dismantling of the world that is messed up today? Um, and again, often that work is helmed by queer and gender diverse people, though, though not necessarily, right? Um, so those are some of the core concepts in this idea of queering solidarity. I think also cultural practice, just like you said, is a, is a core part of that. So like a lot of the folks that I um, work with are also part of like organizing nightlife spaces. They do art and dance and movement and somatics and healing work and that is integral to their activism. It's not a separate thing. Um, and I, I see that also as part of this like queering notions of solidarity. Yeah. So I think we had three other questions. Um, thank you so much. Maybe more than three. Okay. Jump you. in. Yeah, I had two, one observation and then a question. And the one is just relating to sort of identity questions and 
you know, whether one calls oneself a social a scholar activist or an engaged scholar or having social impact. I mean, I think there's a spectrum and it often depends on how you identify yourself because not everyone is an activist. Other people would prefer to have a more passive role but are still very engaged with the issue. But I think we all have a responsibility to, to be somewhere on that spectrum. Um, but it, it, my, my question is around sort of our role as public intellectuals and given that both of you are at institutions. Um, I mean, you're speaking now, I think, more in your personal capacity, but how can we leverage, um, I suppose, the uh, sort of the, I put it in inverted commas, the legitimacy of, of in these institutions that we belong to, to strengthen uh, the social movements and to strengthen the solidarity, and also to use the experiences that we have to feed back into the teaching and learning space and research space. Yeah. Uh, it would be good to hear some reflections on that. Thanks. I love that. Thank you. Um, where were the other questions? Uh, yeah, I had a... Um, so yeah, this is... Thank you so much for the presentations. And this one's for um, Alex. So I am from India and I live in Norway, which I call the most uh, greenwashed country in the world because 60% electric cars, uh, renewables, and, and so on. But of course, we have to understand this, like how these are decoupled, right? We know that, like where are you know the metals, minerals, minerals, minerals coming, coming from? from. But, but then, then coming, coming to, to the South, South African, African context, context, where I suppose, you know, which is more probably similar to the Indian context, there's an energy crisis, there is a need um, for energy, for you know, linked to development processes, not you know, development in codes. So, how do you reconcile some of these struggles, right? Because there are certain communities. There is, you know, as Apadurai calls, aspiration. There are these challenges of aspiration because the, you know, and and that's the critical debate uh, around these reparations, like or degrowth, like you know, redistribution or reduction in the north. Um, for the South to grow, but how does that growth take place in this uh, energy transition space? So in Indian context, we now have all these solar farms, which are hailed very well, supported even by Norwegian and other funding, but this is again displacing local communities who, uh, because they used to be grazing there before, and this is leading to other forms of displacement. So renewables, clearly, you know, Jan asked that in the first Indaba, is really not uh, the solution. But how do we then reconcile these here? And uh, notwithstanding that, what a closed space these conferences like COP or other climate summits are. Like, can you even make it into that room, pay those high fees? Most of the challenging is happening outside by activists. So just wondering, you know, political ecologies about scales, so reconciling some of those. I, I've got a mic here, if I can start oh, my... Um, thanks. Um, my name's Dan um, from uh, Autonomous University, Barcelona, and uh, I wanted to um, pick up on a couple of things you just said, Maya, because um, I think there's an interesting contrast. Um, you said just now about the importance of relationship building and intimacy as a, as a part of activism. And yet, when you were talking about um, academia and activism, and this, I think this follows on from your, your point, Rachel, um, you were talking about academic work as a Trojan horse for activism. Now, if we take the metaphor of the Trojan War, the intimacy that was forged between the soldiers in the horse and outside the horse is not a good model. I just wondered if you um, could, could think of or, or give us cases of relationships between activism and academia which are not built on on this antagonistic basis because because I think you're right there's a lot of antagonism which is there I wondered if it's necessarily so and are there cases where it's where it's not characterized by that relationship thank you yeah it's uh, patrick from johannesburg well when yen started out saying well what is our role in uh, in life, uh, and Rachel's uh, point about that there is a certain prestige and an academic base to support activists. These are very compelling, but I guess we'd also want to claim something 
for our own epistemology, if I'm not mistaken. We don't actually like the prestige of bourgeois academia in its reproduction of ruling ideas, and we want to challenge it, and we get a lot out of activists who challenge power, and they indeed are contributing to a praxis epistemology in which the contestations with uh, structural forces, racism and patriarchy and capitalism and anthropomorphism uh, allow us to see uh, challenges that um, uh, ordinary armchair academics would never see. They'd never understand uh, the structural conflicts between uh, activists and, and these power systems. And often it's an activist who will come to a university and say, you really misinterpreted this power relation. Here's what it looks like right at the site of conflict. And we know that you hear the friction of the clamor in this struggle, but we see, as strategists within the movement, we see more light than you academics. So I think there is actually a, a prestige that goes the other way that I'd like to you know, promote. But I do want to also say when we do this work hand in glove with uh, activist movements, um, we came up at this university, uh, Shauna will remember, uh, with our 10 sins where we go overboard sometimes, very quickly, 10 points. Uh, we're guilty sometimes of gatekeeping with movements and, and even hijacking them. Uh, we are uh, tempted to do substitutionism, uh, a worse version of which um, is ventriloquism with movements, writing press releases and so forth. We're often guilty of careerism and parasitism. Uh, we are uh, tempted towards technicism and legalism. Uh, we are sometimes guilty of divisiveness. It's tempting to be hucksterish and um, uh, romanticize what we connect to in the base. We are often um, guilty of score settling and uh, you know minor petty rivalries that play out in our work with movements. Um, sometimes we have a, a failure of analytical nerve, uh, as many petty bourgeois academics do in revolutionary situations, or where we're afraid to you know criticize our comrades. And finally, sometimes betrayal. So those are 10 sins that I can, you know, we can go on at length, we all know. I mean, I commit one or two of them usually every week still. Um, but these problems really lead me to very quickly to Alex. In getting the strategic insights you have with such great study, um, and a case study like Jet P, where I think you want to add other things, like money is going to ESCOM. ESCOM will use the money for gas, for methane gas. ESCOM is corrupt, according to its outgoing CEO thoroughly corrupt. Uh, ESCOM is using money that is coming in to pay old loans to the same lenders for corrupt plants like Madupi. Anyway, lots of reasons to say uh, it's a, a false solution or it's a reformist reform in the sense that Andre Gortz developed that distinction because it strengthens the logic of the system and empowers you know, the likes of the negotiators who put it together. And that's very distinct from the non-reformist kinds of reform. I would kind of throw that as one of the, I don't know, the benefits of working in struggles where it's th those sorts of distinctions that are the life and death of a movement and what the strategists really tell us. Thank you. So Thank you so much for that. Um, were there any other questions? No, right? We got to all of the hands that were up. Great. I think that's a good number, and we have about 15 minutes left. Um, shall I go first? Okay. So, thank you so much for all of those. I have the question about yeah, leveraging or or working within or combating, you know, struggling against institutions, and also feeding that back into teaching and learning, um, and then I'll come to the other ones about, which is similar, or, or maybe have some parallels. Um, yeah, so I think, I'm thinking about what you just said, Patrick, and that oftentimes the, the, the standing of the institution of the academy is <laughs> not necessarily the one that is like the most 
um, appealing to the activists with whom at least I work or many of the activists with whom we work. So I think there are situations in which like leveraging our institutional capacity or background can be useful for particular campaigns, but I think that requires a power analysis of who we're playing towards, right? So I um, have been supporting some caste abolitionist work primarily in the US uh, and also to some extent in the UK and here. Um, I'm a person with caste privilege who's located within the academy of which there are many, many, many. Um, and so in those cases, it is useful for me to lift up my role as somebody with potentially institutional backing um, as someone that's like militantly caste abolitionist, right? And leveraging that dissent as coming from within the institution of the academy. But I think, I mean, there's many situations in which we're organizing against the, the institutions that we're a part of, right? Like Vitz's precaritization of security workers and other, you know, cleaners and other folks. For me, like I'm organizing with the students and the workers. And if the institution has something to say to that, then we can come to it when we need to. Um, yeah, so for me, I think it's dependent on the power analysis of the moment. Sometimes the institution is useful and sometimes it um, can be a, a difficulty in, in credentialing our legitimacy or our dedication to the movement. And that's when you have to like put your body on the line, right? Um, and I think in terms of like bringing that back to teaching and learning, um, I think the 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 teachers, the radical educators that I've been the most inspired by in my work are the ones who like bring their students onto the front line with them. Uh, and I think I've been really fortunate to have a number of advisors, professors, other teachers, radical educators in movements themselves who do that. Um, and who also model their classroom as a source, as a space of, of debate and critical engagement with the work, right? Like thinking about a Freirean or like a teaching to transgress approach to, to teaching. And I think that's often as easy as just like opening up space for students to talk about the movement work that they're seeing on the day to day and what they think about it. And then how do we relate it back to our subject material? I know that's something that I do frequently. Um, the question about like the, the metaphor of the Trojan horse and the adversarial relationship between academia and activists. Yeah, I mean, it may be the, maybe the metaphor of the Trojan horse is perhaps not the best one, but I think also maybe it does belie some of my own personal misgivings about the, the institution of the university under late stage neoliberal capitalism, right? That like, often I do feel that I am in an adversarial relationship with the institution. And that's about the, the power holders in the institution, right? That's not like necessarily my advisor or other scholar activist comrades. So then again, we have the same question of like inside versus outside strategy. Are we trying to place our like leftist radical uh, scholar activists within positions of power within the institution? I mean, I think we've seen where that hasn't worked out as we would have hoped. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I need to think about that a little bit more, but particularly as like a lowly PhD student, um, often the, the rhetoric of adversarial relationship is often the one that I'm put into, even when I would like to lean into these notions of like queering solidarity and kind of upending relationality in, in the academe. Um, and then there was one more question, right? No, those are those are both of them. But I think, yeah, I mean, like ultimately, it's about shifting all institutions, including academia, and being militant about that work as well. Cool. Uh, maybe I'll just riff off that last point. Um, I think when we think about the role of the the university and the academia. Um, just having a talk discussing reparations. I mean, historically, the, the university has been a, a bastion of colonialism, a bastion of upholding some of the worst injustices, right? So how do we reverse, use the, the university to reverse that role, particularly when many of our universities are captured by neo-colonial 
um, powers. I mean, I think about Wits University. It's got the what Anglo-American planetarium. It's got the um, what is the name of that bridge? The Sabania Stillwater Bridge, named after the company that uh, perpetrated the Marikana massacre. So, like this, this really gross marriage of mineral energy complex capital and the university. I mean, these are the institutions we're in. So I often do feel very ambivalent about being a, a scholar activist. I'm not sure that the university is the best space to do this, but if we can reverse the directionality with which universities extract resources and which universities extract knowledge and you know are often harmful to communities, then hopefully we can do a little bit better than what a lot of the history of universities has been. So I don't think we should romanticize that. Um, too much, um, but yeah, we've got to try our best if we're going to be good scholars and maybe repair some of the harms that have been done in the name of universities. Um, my, my alma mater, one of them is Rhodes University still, they just won't even change that name as a simple tokenistic gesture. I mean, we're so far um, on, on many of these fronts. Um, but then to, to speak to the question about the, the development and the energy side of things and connecting that to, to India's uh, example, I mean, I think it's interesting because in South Africa, often that is the, the narrative that we need coal for development, we need oil and gas for development. And we are in a context of such deep inequality and, and poverty that, you know, anything that can promise that seems attractive. But we've also got a long history of South Africa being the minerals energy complex, right? Having the system that's based on this very extractivist development model and what we've seen is that it doesn't deliver for the, for the many. It concentrates the benefits in the hands of the few, um, and, and it really extracts so much wealth and delivers it elsewhere. Now, we do have, since the end of apartheid, the, the moving of a new black elite into some of those positions of power in that minerals energy complex in South Africa. And so it's been put forward as like this project of racial transformation but it's not a project of economic transformation in the deep sense of redirecting benefits to the many. It's just, in a lot of ways, changing the faces of who's on top of that extractive system. I think that's the dangers of like black capitalism, right, versus like radical eco-socialism and the overthrowing of those capitalist structures. Um, and I think it's also what you pointed to, the dangers of green capitalism, where solar projects are perpetuating some of the similar dynamics because they are um, being driven by some of the similar corporations with similar motives. And so I think we need to ask very deep questions about whether we want the main guiding decision motive as to how projects are developed to be the profits of shareholders, because that is, in a large way, the organizing logic of our economic systems. We claim we're in democracies, but when it comes down to so many of those major decisions about energy projects, it is about shareholders and it is about their interests. So we, I think we need to confront that very seriously if the next energy model isn't just going to replicate similar sorts of dynamics, which I think then segues into Patrick's question about reformist reforms and whether accepting something like the JetP will strengthen that logic or whether it will weaken it if we take certain parts of the JetP. And I think it's a really complicated question. When is a reform a reformist reform, or when is it like a transformative one? Um, and it's hard, particularly when you have c folks that like are clambering for benefits, something tangible, right? And if we say, well, this is going to be a reformist reform, so we need to kick it away and not take it, then does that mean that benefits that could have been delivered to communities aren't there? And I mean, that's an abstract level, right? So I, I guess it's just this is a really challenging question to do it at this very abstract level of the jet P versus like concrete elements of it, like which ones are going to be the ones that are going to be uh, reformists and like strengthen that system. But maybe you're right, the whole package itself seems to be this big legitimating vehicle to drive forward a green capitalist version rather than what was the more radical vision of the just transition that was put forward by trade unions, that was put forward by leftist civil society, progressive civil society, which is a project of transformation. And so maybe in the name of protecting that vision against co-optation by the JP, we must be stronger in rejecting this and stronger at saying we, we want something better, something that's truly just, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Alex, for 
all of that. Thank you to everybody for being here and your really dope conversations. And I hope that we get to continue to talk. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for being here. And talk more soon. Thank you.